in eighth grade, I had stolen some beers from a barbecue I was at and I hid them under my pillow and they stayed there for like two weeks. I honestly forgot about them. This, I was 12 years old, but my dad, or maybe I was 13. My dad found them one day when he was up in my room and the way that they reacted was to me insane. They were crushed and, and my dad especially was really, really sad. Pollux.com, in partnership with Heart Support and the Global Recovery Initiatives Foundation, is proud to present High Notes, a podcast about addiction and recovery in the music business. I'm your host, James Shotwell. My guest this episode is Donovan Malero. Donovan is the drummer and lead vocalist for Hail the Sun, an American rock band from Chico, California, whose new album is expected sometime in 2021. One of the many things that I love about Donovan, and what I feel makes him a perfect guest for our show, is that his decision to get clean precedes his rise in the world of music. He was an addict who found purpose in music, and realized that he had to get clean in order to pursue his passion to the fullest. I think a lot of us could benefit from finding something that Donovan loves as much as music in our lives, and in this conversation, we're going to talk about the transition from addict to musician and how it impacted his life. But first, I want to know just how long he's been sober. I have been sober now for 11 and a half years. My sobriety date is March 14, 2009. Wow. Well, congratulations. Thank you very much. When we have this conversation, Donovan is already 11 years sober. An amazing achievement. And I was curious how he felt when he thought about his life as an addict. It feels like a lifetime ago. It really does. My life now is very much does not revolve around what it used to in that, in that time. And it's just been so long that I live a completely different lifestyle than I once did. Yeah, it's nice. It, it's nice to be able to handle things. I mean, I mean, the first few years, learning how to cope and handle normal situations without the use of eating substances was difficult. I, I felt like I had to relearn how to not only be myself, but a big part of it was how to socialize, how to meet people, how to speak in general and build connections that were real in all aspects of the word, rather than just be bonded to other people by a common liking Mm -hmm. to a certain drug. Before we get too ahead of ourselves, I wanted to go back to the beginning to learn what was happening in Donovan's life in the days and weeks leading up to that night in March when he decided to make a change. Oh, that's a great question. And uh, it always humbles me to think back to those moments. I was going to California State University, Chico, which is about eight hours north of my hometown. And I had just gotten so deep into my addiction and my active using. I, about three months before all this, I called my family, uh, my brother and my parents, and I told them what was going on and that I felt like I was too far into it. I didn't know how to turn back. I was up north for school, but school and everything else had taken a complete backseat. And I definitely saw that if I was continuing to go down this path, in my moments of clarity, I would see that if I continued to go down this path, it was only going to lead me to places that I did not want to be. They came up to Chico and I found out later their plan was going to be to just throw me in the car and bring me back down south for treatment. But they saw that I was in my last week of finals. So they stayed up there with me while I did my finals. And I came back down to Ventura, California with them and immediately started an outpatient program. Well, first a a detox program where that was inpatient. And uh, the wonderful people at the Ventura Drug and Alcohol Center uh, helped me through those first few months of finding the strength to get clean along with my family and my friends. But I I had just hit this point where I didn't feel like myself. My confidence was shattered. My self-esteem was non-existent. I was no longer doing things that I loved to do, that the true me loved to do, because I was constantly distracted by wanting to feel better or feel normal in, in a strange sense of the word, I guess, if you will say that. I relapsed a couple times in in the first two months. But it wasn't until March 13th that I was outside a Narcotics Anonymous meeting with my mom. Uh, And 
just realized at that point we were talking to a mutual friend and I was trying to kick cigarettes at the same time. I was trying to just kick everything at once. And I knew, I, I kind of had a feeling in my heart that that was going to be the last time I did anything because I wanted to, I, I heard these people around me speaking. Uh, what really resonated with, with me was give yourself a break. And they would also say, try it for a year. And if you hate it, you can go back to your old lifestyle, which I, I found comfort in at that time. Because I, I, I thought to myself, well, yeah, if this is boring and this is shitty, then I can always just go back. But I was so sick of being sick and of not having a, a drive or a purpose to what I wanted to accomplish in my life. March 13th was the last time I used. Donovan is hitting on so many great things already. For starters, when somebody chooses to get clean, or at least attempts to do so, they have this fear. This fear that they will never be able to be the person they were before. That they have to completely abandon everything about their life in order to live this different life, which is ultimately better, but is still different than what they know. And there can be comfort in being told that you can go back. That if you try rehabilitation and it isn't for you, or if you don't like being sober, you can always go back to living the other way. I know that that may sound crazy, but if you ever find yourself in such a position, you'll understand the comfort that it can bring. And Donovan is one of those lucky guests who had people in his corner, people who cared about him and were ready to cheer him on. But it may not have been like that if he hadn't opened up. So I had to ask what it was like talking about his problems with his family, specifically with his parents. Well, we had had many conversations like this in the past. I recognize that I am extremely fortunate. I've been graced with incredible parents. They're very understanding and they also are very knowledgeable about addiction. It runs in my family. They were aware of how to deal with it. They had dealt with it with my older brother and, and my dad. I never knew my dad as an alcoholic though. He, he got sober before I was born, but they were just very knowledgeable. So they saw the red flags very early in, in my behaviors in high school, even in middle school. And they would get very concerned. And at the time, I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty, but at the time, I just thought they were constantly overreacting about the littlest things. But I see now that they saw what could potentially happen, what did happen eventually, that they tried very hard to prevent, but still happened. And we had many conversations within that, that last year where they knew I needed help. I knew I needed help. But I really wasn't ready during those times. I'd get maybe three or four days clean. But then that thinking would creep back in where I would tell myself, I'm okay. I can do this casually. Of course, I'm able to go out and have fun and keep it under control. But the conversation, there's two that stick out. It was the one I called. It was when I called them in December of 2008 and told them what I was doing. And yeah, it shocked, it shocked them about the same time. They were very supportive. They weren't going to outcast me by any means. They just wanted to help. And the other one was the day before I got clean. And that was sort of the same thing. Admitted to my mom once more that I had been using and, and she broke down and that killed me to see because everything they did was out of love. I think I finally started to wrap my head around that. It wasn't them trying to control me by any means. They just cared a lot. And when I could finally see that and see that they saw a bigger picture that I myself in that mindset at that time, I just could not see it. I had this tunnel vision of what my life was and what my life would be. And they just wanted me to trust them. And that, that's what that conversation was like. And it wasn't any sort of, but I, I'm not going to say they punished me during that, that time. They just put up very firm boundaries and helped me get back on my feet right before I, I finally made the decision to get clean. And in the first few months, it really was for them. I, I was ready. I realize that now, but I did it for them in the beginning. Anytime I would start to think about wanting to slip up, I would think about my parents, my family, my godfather, think about how I did not want to disappoint them or put them through some of the shit I already had in the past. After hearing Donovan bring up the conversation he had with his parents in December of 2008, I began to wonder when it all began. When he first encountered drugs and alcohol, and when he first started to feel as if he was losing control of his behavior. Yeah, I would say it was my junior and senior year of high school is when I realized I no longer had control over using. 
I, I just needed to under any circumstance. It didn't matter who I was hurting, um, who I was lying to. I just, that was my new way of life. There's a, a moment that sticks out at the very beginning, which I don't think at this point was a huge deal to me, but it was one of those indicators. And it was when in eighth grade, I had stolen some beers from a barbecue I was at and I hid them under my pillow and they stayed there for like two weeks. I honestly forgot about them. This, I was 12 years old, but my dad, or maybe I was 13. My dad found them one day when he was up in my room and it, the way that they reacted was to me insane. They were crushed. And, and my dad especially was really, really sad. My mom was trying to explain to me that this is something I just can't fuck with. Of course, she didn't use that terminology, but she just said, it's hard for you to understand, but this isn't something that you should be doing at, at this age because of what you are preconditioned for. And that was one of those moments where they, they, they had a long talk with me about needing to be extra cautious. And I just didn't get it. And then in high school, I, I did have run-ins with the law. I was never arrested in high school, but I did have disputes with police officers and they would call my parents. And it was the same thing. They were seeing that I was still dabbling in these substances that were very alarming to them. But to me, it was just high schoolers being high schoolers. You know what I mean? That's how I would justify it to myself, at least. Ask anyone who is comfortable discussing their recovery, and I can promise you they will tell you a story about how they came close to the edge. Maybe they got arrested, maybe they almost got arrested, or maybe they almost died, and that was the moment that changed everything. It leaves this impact on them where they realize they are human, they are capable of getting into an even worse situation, and that they have the power to make a change. This is Donovan's story. I did get arrested, finally, when I was 18. And that changed my life for sure. I didn't realize at the time, every, it wasn't a sudden change in my life, but that changed the direction of where my life would go. And that also brought a lot more light into my parents' world of how serious this was becoming. And they kept a much closer eye on me after that. Yeah, I, I, had a lot, I did have a few of those moments where I came super close and in hindsight, was thinking that th they were in a way signs from the universe, like you have to get this under control. I do think that's also probably what actually finally having a real run in with the law was about. But it, it is hard for me to pinpoint a moment because my head was so foggy. Uh, I guess it wasn't until you know right beforehand is when I just given up. I do remember being outside of that meeting and it had just given up. I, I I couldn't fight it anymore. I was just emotionally drained. I was exhausted. I was tired of trying. I was tired of the secrecy. I was tired of the lying. There's that phrase, let go and let God, which scares a lot of people because of the word God in it. And for me, I don't have the, the conventional God that, that I'm sure that phrase uh, is, is suggestive as. But I like it because it was just letting go. I just let go in, in that moment. I said, whatever is supposed to happen, I cannot control it anymore. I'm sick. I'm tired of trying to control everything. Uh, I'm trying to control my moods, trying to have everything line up the way that I want. My way just wasn't working. It just, it was no longer working. And I realized that the day before I finally did make the real attempt at getting clean. I just was tired of fighting it. Many of our listeners may never attend an Alcoholics or Narcotics Anonymous meeting. It's something that you see on TV or in movies, but to be honest, that doesn't paint a complete picture of the event. And we don't talk about it too much on the show because we want to preserve the anonymity of everyone involved. But earlier in our conversation, Donovan talked about attending a meeting with his mother, and I was curious what that experience was like. I've been going for a couple years already uh, alongside my brother. At the time, my parents and my brother thought it would be good for me as well just to be exposed to that. So that wasn't my first meeting. My experiences, I was probably about 17 when I first started going to them at first just as a supportive brother, not as someone myself recognized I needed to be there. But I really liked them. I liked the camaraderie. The rooms just had so much growth. I love to hear these people's stories. And not the war stories. Of course, you have to look. For me, I just had to look past that shit. I, I really had to focus on what they say, focusing on the similarities, not the differences. There was a lot of things I could not relate to with a lot of the people I met in those meetings. But 
just the overall aura of positivity and growth and a new found perspective was what was really appealing to me. There was never a time where I thought that they were cheesy or corny or, or that I didn't like them. I, I always really enjoyed hearing the stories and seeing people who you could tell were at the bottom, insane bottoms, and had bounced back. Insane that I am remembering there were people in there who were like 50, maybe late 40s, and they had talked about losing houses, losing their marriage, losing their kids, and not fully realizing it until they were over 40 when they finally decided or they realized what was going wrong. And that always stung so much to hear. It was tragic to me. It was so sad. And I wasn't sad for these people. They obviously had found what they needed and were doing better in life. But I did not want to find myself at that point. And they would speak to people of my age. I was 18, 19, 20 at the time. I would say, you don't, that doesn't have to happen to you. You still can catch this very early on. And you don't have to have the same story that so many of us have. That really resonated with me. I, I couldn't imagine losing a marriage or a house or my kids over something like that. It was just too, it was too much to bear. As you can probably gather from Donovan's comments, the vulnerability on display in meetings is incomparable. It's a room where people feel comfortable sharing their life stories, every vivid detail, and they're telling it to complete strangers. And when you're in that space, listening to someone else's journey, it really gives you perspective. It's a good reminder that you are not the center of the universe, and that your problems are not worse than anyone else's. You can overcome the things that you think cannot be overcome, you are stronger than you think you are. Exactly. It, the, it, there was so much spiritualism in the room, which I, I really liked. And, and I had to just listen. I, I hardly spoke. I just listened. And I'm, I was so used to always thinking my way was right. And it was a really good way to just push that mentality out and fully try to soak up what everyone else was saying, to, to get over myself. To not think every, to not be so self-centered, and to just listen and try to learn and be a lot more humble than I had been in the past. Donovan no doubt benefited from those days spent in meetings, listening to other people tell their stories. But eventually, the day came when Donovan himself had to commit to sobriety, and when that happened, he chose to go cold turkey, which is another way of saying he decided to quit everything all at once: no drugs, no alcohol, no cigarettes. So while his body was craving something to give him a fix, he denied himself everything. And as you can imagine, that was a fairly difficult thing to do. Um, the cold turkey experience is what I got in March uh, when I actually did, did get clean. I had done detoxes prior to that, as I'd mentioned, but I had continuously relapsed. So when that time came, it was time to just, there was no more facilities that I was going to try to lean on. It was just all at once. It was, it sucked. At first, obviously, I felt like shit. I was very discouraged. It felt like there was a huge cloud over me at all times. There was a fog. I could not see through this fog. Anywhere I went, anything I thought of, the future, my past, it was all just very hazy. I was trusting everyone around me saying, that will lift and you'll come out of it and be able to start learning more. And that's exactly what happened. After about a week, I just felt like there was this rebirth inside of me. I felt like I was starting to act and learn. And I felt myself start to grow. I, I just felt this sense of there was like a newfound clarity. And then the hope kicked in. A few weeks after that, I started feeling hopeful. I started thinking, actually, life can be fun. Life can actually still be okay. I, I, I delivered pizzas in college during my using years. I really loved the job. But I remember specifically driving through Chico one day, fully committed to the fact, this is in 2008, that I was going to use forever. And I, I was talking out loud to myself about it. I, I was so, I'd resolved to that conclusion. Life was totally not worth living if I couldn't be constantly getting high <laughs> like that i i remember that and i remember the street i was on too I, and i felt so comforted in that i thought this is just me this is me and that's okay this is me this is what i like to do 
I can't imagine doing it any other way. That's not exciting. Anyone else that doesn't understand it just doesn't understand me. And I won't go into the philosophy of how that may be true for other people or not. That's not important. For me, it definitely wasn't. I was just in a very fucked up state of mind. So fast forwarding to what I was talking about, hope, that was relieving to start to feel that hope, start to feel the idea that I can still have great relationships. I can still do things that I loved and not only have those things, but thrive in them without the use of substances. We understand that the insight and information provided by this show can sometimes feel overwhelming. So we try to make it a point to talk to our guests about simple things, the phrases or lessons that stick with them and have always carried them throughout their recovery journey, lessons that they can turn to when they're in doubt. And for Donovan, this is the phrase that sticks out to him the most. I love the grant me the serenity for the things I cannot change, uh, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I, I'm always thinking about that. And the tail end of that is the most important part. The wisdom to know the difference is just so profound because there's things that I'll experience where I'll have to think, what can I change about this to be better or to feel better? And it's usually only things that, it's only my behaviors and my perspective. I can't control certain things no matter how hard I want to, no matter how hard I try, maybe temporarily, but it doesn't last if it's not supposed to. So that last part of that saying is very, it resonates very deep with me. As you can probably guess, music is incredibly important to Donovan but his relationship with it changed the further he got into recovery. I always wanted to do exactly what I'm doing now, okay? And during the time of my active using, I still did. I, was, I wasn't, but I thought I was trying. Does that make sense? It was, it's just such like petty behavior. I would complain. I would think in my head, why am I not? Why can't? I, I just felt so low. I felt lesser than everyone. And I, and I would see friends of mine who seemed to start thriving in that department, I guess it was a sense of entitlement. I would think, why can't I be doing this like I want? But th at the same time, the answer was right in front of me. I was so, I was not in the right mindset. My priorities were so shifted. It was not a priority. I used to use it at the beginning because I felt like it, it would make the music more interesting. And I will admit, I, I feel like I've written some pretty crazy shit while in that state of mind. However, that was short lived. Eventually, all it did was take me away from music. It took me away from music and away from my potential. Uh, my potential was so much more present when I cleaned up my act. And luckily, that, that still did take a little bit of time. I'd say about three months in. I equate this newfound drive that I acquired mm -hmm. was just the drive that I would use in my active state of addiction. I would constantly be trying to look at ways to hustle and, and get high and, and do the things that we like to do back then. It, I'm sure you know how it is. Like you can get very creative and you have this really sort of, you have this special sense of motivation when you want to score, you want to do something like that. So I, I turned that into that same type of mentality, but towards music. I remember thinking, I am going to put everything that I, all the energy I would use into doing all of these unhealthy activities, I'm now going to fully put it into music and growing myself as a musician and in, in the music industry. Yeah, that's all I want. That became the new, I'm not going to say the new drug, that sounds kind of, kind of stupid to me, but it became this new sense of purpose in, in my life. And I put everything I had towards that. So music ended up being the much more healthier alternative to the, all of that drive and motivation and, and energy spent that was going to a, a not so good place before. It was now going towards my career and what I wanted to do. I just, I never looked back after that. After I started to, started to see results, I started to realize my potential. I saw that shit was working and I thought that I played out as long as I wanted and accomplish the things that I wanted to accomplish because there was this, just this new sense of confidence that I acquired and it, ha and it was all around music mm -hmm. and what I wanted to do. Whenever somebody creative is tasked with getting sober, there's a little voice in the back of their head that says they may never be able to create the way they did once they get sober. As if the drugs and alcohol or whatever it is they're doing is the only source of inspiration. But something that you learn over time is that that isn't the case. 
That doesn't mean that those thoughts go away, however, and the only advice I can really offer is this. When you start to feel like you need to do something to use a substance in order to be creative, play it out. Play out the whole thing. Because just taking one drink or smoking one joint or doing one hit of whatever it is probably won't stop there. So play it out. You'll do that, and then what? You'll do it again, and then what will happen? Maybe you'll lose your job or your relationship will fall apart. Play it all the way out, and then ask yourself if it's worth it. And more often than not, you're going to find out that it isn't. It's not worth it at all. That's exactly <laughs> right. I, I, and that, I'm, I'm glad you said that, because that is, anytime I've had those thoughts creep in, I play it out. I play it out sometimes months, months ahead. Mm -hmm. And I'll think well, this eventually will try. That's just the way I am. That that's the way I am. There's nothing wrong with it. Not everyone's like that. And that's totally cool. I don't preach to people about it, especially people that don't have problems. I've never been that type of personality where I'm scolding everyone I know for drinking. I'm scolding everyone I know for recreationally using. It's not my place at all. But, but for me, I just can't. That was the hardest thing to accept, mm -hmm. which was the other revelation about six months in was that finally sunk home or it, it, it sunk in, struck a chord with me. And I stopped fighting that. I stopped. I, mm -hmm. I just wanted to do the same activities as everyone else my age was doing, which is a whole other commentary on society in itself, but we won't go there. I, I just realized that I, I couldn't, I just couldn't. And that was totally fine. And some people <laughs> wouldn't understand. I can't tell you how, many, how much breath I fucking wasted in the first year explaining to people who would challenge me on it, who would be like, just have a beer or just do this. You, you can do it. Like all that shit's brainwashed into your head anyway. Like you, you're able to. And I would, try, I would actually take the time to try to explain, which I realize now is just wasted breath. I, I went from doing stuff like that to then, then – Later on in, in my recovery, it just wasn't worth the energy. I would say I, I had to drive. Like if someone was going to challenge me, which it hardly ever happened, but it would just, I would lean on, oh, I've got to drive later or, oh, I'm on a medication. I can't do that. It was just, it was very easy to get around because I, I no longer had anything to prove. I no longer needed people to validate my decision. I didn't need people to accept that and totally understand it. It just, it was what it was. And that was that. And that was totally fine. It is funny how we're almost programmed to be defensive. We feel like we have to defend our choice to get sober, but you don't. It's okay. You can just tell people that you're sober, that you're choosing not to drink or do drugs. Yeah, exactly. And I've got many friends that obviously still drink and will do their own thing. And most of them, I don't think have problems. And, and that's fine if they can do it. If, if, they ever, if I ever felt like they were having issues, I would absolutely speak up. But not everyone's brain's the same. That's just what I had to realize about myself. I'm just not that way. I can't do it. I wish I, I wish I could. I wished I could, but I could not. Donovan was working on his sobriety before Hail the Sun became popular. Once the band started to take off, Donovan had the opportunity to tour, which he and the band have done extensively over the last decade. And with touring comes opportunities, opportunities to live out the wild rock star lifestyles we've all seen in movies and in television. So I asked Donovan what it was like navigating the touring world as a person in recovery. And I've been offered lots of stuff over the last 10 years for sure. <laughs> Surprisingly, it, it has not been. And that surprised me at the beginning as well. It was, I think I had enough time and a strong enough foundation that when I was around cocaine or when I was around anything like that, like these common things found on the road, it was very easy to just step away or to just leave the room or to turn it down. And for the most part, my experiences, everyone's been so respectful. I've never been, I don't think I've ever been on the road or in, in a, a, a moment in my career within the industry or, or working or touring where I've gotten shit or been belittled because of that. I mean, if it's happened, it hasn't been in front of me. So it, it, it hasn't been too too difficult, if I'm being honest. We often ask our guests if they can pinpoint a moment or experience that they feel would never have happened if they didn't get clean. And this was Donovan's response. I think everything past that point, I've, <laughs> and I have thought about that. I think there's things that I wrote down, life goals of mine that I wrote down a while ago that have since happened. Very big also on the, on the law of attraction and that type of mentality, which came after my sobriety. But I do think that everything up until this point, I've done some things that I've, I have always wanted to do 
And if my head wouldn't have been right, if I hadn't course corrected where my life was going back in 2009, I really don't think any of this would have, have happened. It's impossible to know. It's impossible to know. But that's what my gut, that's what my heart tells me. Um, Cause I would not be who I am today on, on either sides of the coin. If I was using or if I wasn't using, I mean, it has changed. It has made who I am today, but I don't think I would be exactly who I am. I'm mean, who knows. I, I actually don't think I would have ever found the motivation. It was that drug driving energy that I turned towards put into my focus on music and the career that I had chosen that I felt propelled me along and that would not have happened if I was still expending useless energy doing things that were getting me nowhere. Donovan is correct in saying that we can never know for sure what may or may not have happened, but I do believe that recovery gives people a deeper appreciation for life, even the small moments. Definitely, definitely. I, I've tried more and more to live in the moment, and, and I do think it's worth saying also that, once again, I've been extremely lucky to have the support group that I have, and that extends to my bandmates. There's never been an issue there. Two of us are sober and two of us aren't. I don't mind that there's beer on the bandwagon. I, I don't mind that kind of stuff. That, that, that's something that I can provide no threat to me at all. But if it did, the people that I call my brothers, basically, at this point in our careers, would understand and they would adjust accordingly. But lucky for me, it doesn't present any type of issue. And for them, we just have this, this very cool understanding and they've always been very supportive about it. It's just never presented any type of friction. As my time with Donovan began to wind down, I had to ask him the same question we ask every guest. When was the last time that you had a craving to use? And when was the last time you felt genuinely tempted to do so? I cannot remember the last time I felt tempted. But the last time I had a craving, God, it, it's been a while, man. It's been, it's been quite a while. Donovan is a great example of what you can do when you decide to get your life together. And as an artist, He's channeled his experiences into song, which have made fans open to sharing their stories with him. He hears stories of people struggling with addiction, abuse, and other problems regularly. And we don't give advice on this show, but I was curious, when fans come to him and ask for help, what suggestions does he offer, especially to those suffering from addiction? I wanted to be known, as you mentioned already, that I, I'm not preaching. Sometimes I feel like it can come off that way. If it does, that, that's not the intention. I'm just speaking from my own personal experiences. There's people out there that I've, as I mentioned that can do whatever they want to do and still accomplish the things they want to accomplish. For me, I had to cut out uh, what we've all already discussed for me to be able to get to where I'm at today. So that being said, I also say that I'm still learning. I'm still very much in the thick of, of learning life and ha how to navigate things. It's not so much, it doesn't revolve around drugs anymore. That's, I definitely feel like that is no longer a part of my everyday thinking. But a lot of the behaviors that came with it, a lot of the reasons why that was even an issue to begin with are still things that I'm learning to deal and cope with today. So that being said, in the more immediate sense, I tell them if someone's asking me what, if they think that they have a problem, I do suggest meetings. Uh, even if it's not something that they like, I'm also not, a, as, as what you and I would, will understand this term, um, an NA or AA Nazi by any means. I don't go to meetings even these days all the time. I won't say the last time I've been to a meeting. It hasn't been too long, but I, it's not something that is a part of my everyday life. But they help me get my start. They help me realize more whether or not I did have an issue. I related to a lot of the behaviors that they would talk about. It was one way for me to go, okay, I'm aligning and I'm, and I'm, I'm aligning with what this person is saying, and I feel similarly, so maybe I do indeed have an issue. And from that point, I do think it's important to get professional help. I think, I think everyone in, on this earth should have therapy. Just, it just feels good to be in therapy, it, regardless of if you have issues or not. It just feels nice to be able to talk to a third party. I think that's important. And realizing that they don't have to live that way. That, that's another point that I, I'll, I would stress to these people who feel like they have an issue. You don't have to live that way. You, 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 you actually can choose a different path. It can be really, really hard, but it's very rewarding in the end if you're able to go that route. 
have said before that I'm not a qualified counselor. I'm not a drug counselor. So take what I say with a grain of salt. I'm just sort of regurgitating things that have worked for me and things that I've heard from qualified counselors who have helped me along in my way. Especially this time, dude, the pandemic has, with everything going away, it's been tough to figure out what I'm doing in general. I've had a lot of things happen in my life during this time frame with career and, and, and everything else that just felt put on hold. And as someone that constantly relied, relied on the go, go, go aspect of living and, and needing to put this energy to use, I've had to sort of figure out again, how to spend my days, what's important, what's not important, how to live in the moment, all those things that I still, uh, in the very, very beginning of my, of my recovery, were much more present in that time. I, 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 I can relate to that in this current time, just not as intense, if that makes sense. And for, for anyone that is listening and, and is concerned for themselves or might know someone, I also say envision your life the way you, you would actually want it. If you're unhappy, envision your life the way you would want it and know that for the most part unless you you want to jump off a roof and actually fly you know that that's impossible at, at this you cannot do that but for the most part it's possible to get there and if you feel like substance abuse is holding you back from that or maybe more of a distraction than something that's positive or recreational then cut that out and see if you can get closer to the way that you envision your life and, and what you want to do and what really drives you. Cause that's something I, I did at the beginning and it's something I still do. It's something I do quite often, honestly, with what do I want to accomplish next? And sometimes I surprise myself in good ways and in bad ways. It's very important to reevaluate what I want to do, how I'm going to do it. And before drugs would just always get in the way, but now they don't. And that was the choice that I needed to make to be able to do what I'm doing. My conversation with Donovan was a great reminder that the work is never done. Even a decade into his sobriety, Donovan is still focused on improving himself. He's not the person that he dreams of being just yet, but he's well on his way, and he isn't too hard on himself for the places where he still falls short. He knows that he's a constant work in progress, and that's perfectly okay. If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction, please get help. The High Notes team is here for you. The Heart Support Team is here for you. The Global Recovery Initiatives Foundation is filled with people, all of whom are here for you. We want to cheer you on. We want to listen to you. We want you to feel as if you matter because you do. So please reach out. For High Notes, my name is James Shotwell. The show is produced by Holix.com and edited by our producer, Landon DeFever. Laura Haggard is our programming consultant. The music for our show was produced by the band You, Me, and Everyone We Know, and the art was made by the great Nick Farron. You can find more about High Notes on Instagram and Twitter by looking up High Notes Pod. That's High Notes P-O-D. There are more episodes coming soon, so please stick around. And in the meantime, all we ask is that you take care of yourself, because you deserve it.